Morning folks, uh, yeah, Friday today and uh, I'm starting work a bit earlier, um, my boss has changed my hours again and uh, yeah, just part of the usual uh, video diary or whatever of what I'm doing with my life and it's a big change, I'm making the biggest change ever and I'm doing things now the right way, I'm, um, I'm following um i'm following my higher power now as we were all taught in rehab and in alcoholics anonymous and the program accepting and understanding that what was wrong with me and what is wrong with me is a spiritual malady there's no medical problem that's wrong with me it's not a medical solution um, i tried the antidepressants i was on the antidepressants for almost seven years uh, they didn't work um, the problems in my life were only getting worse so um, I'm not on it's been um, two years nearly now away from antidepressants uh, I don't take any medication now from uh, from the doctors all I take is um, well all I do now well I stopped drinking on the 1st of January and I haven't had a drop of alcohol since so that's a massive thing for me. All I take now is that pile of stuff there. So glucosamine sulfate for my uh, aches from all shit that I've done with BMX in. Got a bad ankle. I'll always have a bad ankle for the rest of my life. Started taking cod liver oil. I don't know why, but uh, vitamin C, vitamin B, all this stuff. It's like vitamins. Well, I'm not going to get them all out. I've just had them now, but it's... Uh, like Alex Jones used to say, because I used to watch Alex Jones since I was a kid. Take your vitamins, kids. The globalists are trying to fucking destroy you. They're trying to make you into fucking sacks of fucking Kemp worms. Take your vitamins, kids. Do your exercise. Get fresh air. Um, stop eating junk food. He's talking to the Americans, right? <laughs> but he's also talking to me as well, because I used to listen. I used to watch Infowars. Not all the time, because internet one not as easily accessible as it is now. But uh, Alex Jones, I've known about him since I left school in 1999. And he's a fucking legend. He is. He's a hero, is what Alex Jones is. Because he's someone who's fighting for the truth. But Alex Jones is on his journey. And um, the Americans are on their journey. They're probably headed for a civil war. This is going to be a very big year in American history because they're all after Trump and uh, all the American people are, are almost all on Trump's side, but they're, they're going to kill Trump. They are going to kill him. They'll, they'll kill him. Trump will probably die. They'll, they're probably going to kill him in prison. But the Americans are um, on their journey and uh, I don't care because I'm not an American. But I am a citizen in a country that is controlled by the United States of American Empire. I am a, uh, our country is a satrap of an empire, and it's the American global empire, which is crumbling. So it, it kind of is important. I do listen, uh, well, I do pay attention to what's going on over there, but I'm not really that bothered. <clears throat> we're, we're, um, I'm and and then again, I'm not really bothered what goes on in my country. It doesn't matter. I'm not voting anymore. Not interested. I'm interested in changing me because if my dream always was a few years ago, um, I've spoke about it before when I have seen some of these people in um, recovery who were, who were my heroes. They are people who can make it away from addiction from drugs, hardcore drugs, and um, alcohol, which is one of the worst. Alcohol is probably the worst drug, and it is readily available to us. But people, you know, you hear stories from heroin addicts, and, and it works with all different things. Um, cocaine, weed, I've heard people um, who talk about what I'm talking about, they talk about smoking marijuana and weed in the same way they say that that drug was destroying my life it was toxifying my brain i could see the world for the way that i thought it was 
when I was smoking it but as soon as I stopped smoking it I was terrified and I needed it and and I, look everyone's different everyone's on their own journey but I've heard people who've conquered that and they don't smoke it anymore and they say everything's making sense now and um, I can make changes in my life I'm not feeling anxiety I'm not feeling depression and everything so it's different for everyone different drugs for different people but my main one was alcohol and it and it is alcohol but so my dream was always when I saw those people and I didn't see many unfortunately I saw lots of lot I've met lots and lots of people in recovery and they're all inspiring but there were certain ones that I could just tell that they'd got this thing that they'd just really they'd done it not that they'd got it intellectually because I got it intellectually it's that they'd done it and they'd put it into practice in their lives and I always um, remember one guy he was called JC I don't know what his name was his initials were JC <laughs> JC John Connor like on Terminator, or uh, James Cameron, JC, Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Um, it's weird, it's interesting, isn't it? All these, uh, all these people. Yeah, JC, this guy from um, over in Barnsley. I don't know anything now. It's been a long time. It's been probably six years since I saw him. But, uh, and you know, people can change. They can. But when I saw him then. He was one of these guys, he'd fucking got this thing. And he was living it as well. And I always thought, you could put that man, a grapple hook could come and pick him up and take him out of that room in Barnsley. And they could just go, hmm, oh, we're a drone. Yeah, that's what it is now, it's drones, isn't it? A Ukrainian or Russian drone on the battlefield could come and just drop a grapple hook and pick him up and chuck him in the Ukrainian battlefield or in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or in the fucking Sahara Desert or in the tundra over in Siberia and he'd be all right he might die but he'd be okay he won't be scared anymore and he'd just he'd, he'd adapt all of the skills all of the information that he'd got he'd just put it boom into practice and he'd be all right he'd be spiritually okay because, as I say, this problem for me, I know 100% it's a spiritual malady. It's not a medical solution. I mean, there are um, problems that happen when you're um, taking drugs all the time that you need medical help. But, you know, in the work, in, in what I've, I've been learning, it's um, healing, the true healing process is threefold. It's therapeutic and therapy is talking. So talking about it. Then the second one is pharmacological. So um, pharma, pharmacon, the, the Greeks called it, because this is coming from the Greek definition of what healing is. Um, pharmacon, pharma, pharmacology. So medical, there might be medical help that is necessary. So medications and things to help you sleep, maybe things to um, heal your body medically. So the first one is talking, fa um, th therapy. The, this, the second one is pharma pharmacology, pharmacological. And the third one is this, it's spiritual, finding um, a spiritual, uh, it's God is what it is, it's God. God, in in Alcoholics Anonymous, it'll say God as we understand Him, because they're not going to be preachy about it. That they're not going to say you have to follow Jesus Christ, you have to follow Allah, you have to um, follow. You know, they're not going to say that. They're just going to say God, and it's up to you to decide, or me to decide, and me to find out what God is in my life. And I can fully see now that alcohol was my god and i was i i'd put alcohol in the place where god should have been and it goes deeper than that now 
now that I'm sober, I I'd put me. I, I no, I haven't done that now. But what it was, alcohol was the main thing, and then what what I'd done is in my life over my life over the last uh, forty one years, uh, gradually, not all the time, but I was putting me. Whatever me is, I was just listening to a C.S. Lewis thing, and he 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 was so brilliant. Him, him who wrote the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and um, he became a Christian later in life. He was he, one of the great scholars of this country has ever produced. Just an absolutely brilliant man. He did a fucking essay about what I is like. I I is I am. Um, and then he talked about God and he says, well, I came up with God. God and I sit in my mind in a place where I create. He talks about the ego and things and it's, it's so high level philosophy. And uh, well, it's not philosophy. It's um, he's using logic. But he was working at a high level that I, I, I'm quite intelligent and I find it hard to understand. It's very hard to understand. C.S. Lewis was um, a brilliant man. He was uh, extremely intelligent. And um, he got the thing, Christianity, and he became, um, it's um, amazing really. Um, he was late in life, I think he was in his 40s when he, when he converted to Christianity. And he became a Christian apologist. You know, apologising. You're um, you're going around. <laughs> Apologia is um, you know going around and um, um, follow. It's living, Jesus, living life according to Jesus' teachings, and um, spreading the word and just saying this is how I live my life. This is what I'm doing, and um, hopefully you know it rubs off on other people. Because that's what Jesus said. You don't go around preaching that you live like this and you need to do this and you need to do that. You leave other people alone and you lead by example. Because I'll get to it in a minute. That's what Jesus said in his time. It, the people who were following the Mosaic law of the Ten Commandments, the, the Jewish people at the time, of, of amongst whom Jesus came from, Jesus was a Jew. He was born in that part of the world. People who were following the Mosaic Law of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are um, Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Number five, Honour thy father and thy mother. Number six, thou shall not kill. Oh no, hold on. Number one, thou shall have no other God before me. I'll read it again because it's important. The Ten Commandments, I need to know this because Jesus said, I don't come to change the Ten Commandments. I come to fulfil the law. Because these were people in that part, in the, in the world, in the Roman Empire at the time, who were living their life. Their constitution for their life was this, was the Ten Commandments. And not only the Jewish people, but the people who lived around them lived like that as well. Because they looked up to the Jews, because they thought, hold on, their way of living is actually quite a cool way. You know, like, whatever they're doing, whatever, however they're living their life, it's working because they are quite good with each other and they don't generally war with each other. There's always been different sects in Judaism. The Pharisee movement that, that was predominant at the time was just a sect, just the way that we'd look at Zionism today. Within Zionism, there's um, different sects. There are. Not all Jews are exactly following exactly the same thing. They hopefully, and they should be all following the Ten Commandments, but they all differ slightly, and and so the the, the Jews sort of maybe argue amongst each other, but they do it according to that. They're not going around killing each other. You know that's the thing. Vladimir Zelensky, um, the leader now, the dictator of Ukraine, at the beginning of this war, he 
It wasn't him, it was some rabbis in Israel. They asked, they begged Vladimir Putin not to kill Zelensky. They said, don't kill him because he's a Jew. They will do that. They'll promote it around the world. Leave our people alone. Just don't kill them. Don't perse persecute them. And we have um, followed that, you know, um, people. Vladimir Zelensky is Jewish. He was born. Um, Vladimir Zelensky is Russian. He, his first language is Russian. And he only learned Ukrainian later in life when he was doing the TV show. And when Victoria Newland and the Americans picked him out to be the leader of Ukraine or a candidate to run for the elections, he was doing the TV show um, Serve the People, Serving the People. And it was a huge TV show in Ukraine. And um, he is a good actor. He is he's a fucking very good actor. He's acting now. He's acting in the in the role that is going to probably cost him his life. So he's acting to the highest of his abilities now. If he do not get this right, he's dead. Because uh, the Russians say that now. They, they've gone back on it. They've said um, Israel... The people in Israel have said to the Russians, look, I know he's a bad man, but don't kill him because he's Jewish and he's one of us. And uh, I think the Russians are just going to tell Israel to go fuck itself now. Uh, he's a dead man, he's Zelensky, he's dead. He's not going to live long. Dmitry Medvedev says they will drag him and hang him from a lamppost for what he's done. Um, he said something in Russian along those lines. He said, we're going to fucking butcher him for what he's done. We're going to kill him and we're going to kill the entire lot of the of the leadership in Ukraine. But <laughs> they said they wouldn't do they said they wouldn't do it to him because he's Jewish. But um I, I think uh, this war has got so crazy over there now that they're just like fuck this, fuck this guy. Because that's the thing with Zelensky, he's neither um you can call yourself Jewish but but you don't necessarily follow the Ten Commandments. I think Judaism is a race of people. So there's many Jew Jews in the world who don't believe in God. They're, they're atheists. Vladimir Zelensky is a globalist. He believes in the ideology of globalism. And, and like I say, he calls himself Ukrainian. He ain't Ukrainian, he's Russian. He was a Russian-speaking Ukrainian. And Ukrainians, it's just like saying... I'm a Yorkshireman, do you know what I mean? I'm British. The Ukrainians are Russian, they always have been. Are part of, the, no, they are Slavic, they're the Slavic people. But anyway, enough about Ukraine, it's toxic. The Jewish people in that time, and to this day, um, hopefully, they follow the Ten Commandments. That's the constitution of their life. So, number one is, Thou shall have no other God before me. Number two is, Thou shall make no... Thou shall make unto thee no... Hold on. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image. So, try to do learn about what that means. It's important because I'm learning to do that and it's very difficult. Number three, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Some people go, Sabbath is on a Sunday. No, it's not. Some people say Sabbath is a Saturday. It doesn't matter, it can be any day. Really, the day of the Lord should be in the ideal world every day. That's what Jesus comes to say. All this stuff about praying and just going on a Sunday that's hypocrisy, because what are you doing Monday to Saturday? Well, it was it was Saturday when people used to have the Sabbath day then. What what we call Saturday now. Um, not all all of them did, but some people. There are some uh, groups in the world that have their Sabbath day is the Saturday, but Jesus said this is the prime example of hypocrisy. Why not have the Sabbath day every day? 
the Sabbath day, men, you keep these and you keep this. You, you, you live your life like this for one day and then the other six days. You just try your best. But in clown world, in the real world, it's very difficult to live your life like this. But the Jews tried very hard in that time. They really did try hard to live every day like this. And that's what I'm going to get to in a minute. It's extremely hard to do. Jesus, when he came, because he's updating this, he's saying, right, you have to live like this every day, every minute of every day. And that's why they killed him, because it's, it's almost impossible. But it's something to aspire to. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Honour thy father and thy mother. Number six, thou shalt not kill. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Number ten, thou shalt not cover or be jealous. You don't you do be jealous of another human being. So they're the Ten Commandments. And, you know, just using it as a sort of a blueprint or, a, like I say, it's something to aspire to. So I've had to work out for me what God is. It's not me anymore. It's not. Because that falls into one of the sins of, 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 of going against it. It's, it can't be me and it was me and I realised how it was. I took away alcohol and all that was left when alcohol had gone was me. My own ego and my own willpower. And so I were, my willpower on its own was leading me into destruction. It was. So it has to be God now and it is God. And look, I'm going through some problems at work. I'm being micromanaged. And anyone who's been micromanaged before knows what it's like. It's, it's, it's awful, it's shit. Every single thing that I do has been analysed. And um, it's difficult. My boss is a very hard man to work for. He is. He's a very difficult man. He's, he is. And... What I'm learning now, um, there's big changes now. Jack's gone. He's had enough, I think, and he's just gone, and he's gone on to his own journey, you know, on to his own life. I hate that word journey, but it's true. Everyone's life is a journey, unless you sat around doing fuck all, and it's not, is it? Jack's going on to do his own thing, and I got on well with him, and he just had enough, and I'm left. Now, I've got a new line manager, and he's a... He seems like a decent guy to me. I had a long talk with him yesterday and he's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He's come and he's got his new job and um, that's how I started when I got this. You know, you come and it's really optimistic and full of energy. But let's see how he is after a couple of weeks. I personally think my boss is running it into the ground, but it's not for me to say. I, I mean, I can say it, but I don't really have a... Um, I say, do I? I'm just uh, an employee. And that's the important thing that I've got to learn now. Humility. I am quite a humble person. But I realise that what God's done for me is, is given me everything that I wanted. In, in one dimension he has. He's given me the ability to be able to see in my life for the first time what my life means what it all means it is put lo the logos the logos logic because that's what jesus said he is i am the logos i am the word and the word is, is <clears throat> in the beginning there was the word and the word was with god and then god made the word into flesh <laughs> and it's like um, he is the logic, his logic, crystal clear logic, he's been able, he's, he's given me logic to be able to see that everything happened for a reason and everything makes sense, hopefully. And he's given me that gift, 
he's given me like all the things that come with that all the things that come with that because now that i can see sense that the the weight is off my shoulders all this baggage all this heavy weight this really spiritually heavy weight it was so heavy i couldn't carry it anymore that's why i was drinking to the extent i was and i knew that i needed to stop drinking but i felt so low when i and i felt so burdened when i did stop drinking that i decided i can't take this anymore so i'm going to take my own life i'm gonna i'm gonna die i want to die that's the state that i was at and what he's done is he's removed the burden and and it's just like just this weight off my shoulders and it's like literally like it's happened someone said you've lost a lot of weight it's like it's just fallen off me it's it's all this swollen just um bitterness and it's just gone or it's going and it's getting better every day that's the greatest gift he's given me that is, is he's taken the burden and it's nothing to him absolutely effortless it just what was so heavy to me all this all this stuff that's happened in my life all this all the things that people have said to me all the things that i've done to them all the regrets all the jealousy all the bitterness it, it's not it was so it was it was destroying me but to him it just removes it effortlessly and it's amazing and that's why i owe him i owe jesus my life i owe him everything everything that i've got now it's like i'm in this predicament where when when this is happening i'm like how do i pay him back but this is the thing he doesn't want me to pay him back it's not a transaction like that and that's the thing me i've been me for 41 years and i'm so used to seeing things like that if someone does something i owe them if if i do something for them do they owe me and, and you know uh, it, it, god does not work like that god works in a mysterious way and like like everyone who seriously understands what how god works in their life they all say the same thing and all the great theologians say the same thing we will never know god's true nature we won't it's 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 alien to us it's 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 like impossible for our minds his timeline is outside of our timeline he does not work on a timeline like ours and the plans that he has for our life are unknowable to us. They just are. Um, like the difficult chapters that we're in and stuff. It's like it's a chapter. I am the word. It's a book. And sometimes you're in a gripping part in a book. And it's like fucking hell this is awful. But you haven't got to the end of the book yet. The end of your life is the end. And you, you know. There might be some funny chapters to come. There might be. You know. It's it's difficult no one understands and it's deeply mysterious and trying to know god is to to die that that's what it says in eastern orthodoxy if you try to see the face of god it'll be the last thing that you see it will be um it'll be um it'll be death trying to know the face of god and see the face of god that's when you die you know it'll be the last thing that you see and then you know you, you're not on this earth anymore you're in the next one so it's a fruitless enterprise you can get to see him face to face if you want but I, I, you won't be here anymore you'll be up there or through this crap you'd have got through it because that's what i understand it's dimensional it's not up there it's through you've got through this existence You've like walked through like a um, a mirror, if you like, but you can never go back. No one ever comes back. No one ever comes back. Um, once you're dead, you're dead. Your body is worm food, right? But it's the spirit that goes through the other side. The soul. So that's a fruitless enterprise. 
uh, you know thought about that early on i want to see god i want i want to meet this person i want not not this but i want to meet this thing i want to get closer to it you know like this the sun but if you get close to the sun you're gonna melt <laughs> right remember how it works lucifer means light bearer if you stand in the sun too long lucifer will fry you because he is the sun if you like is the um the energy is the light but jesus says my father is the light and you're like he made the light don't try to fly too close to the sun because you'll burn up but then you'll be with my father <laughs> it's like oh man icarus he tried to do that didn't he? he tried to make the wings to fly close to the sun and then the glue melted and all feathers fucked off and he fell down to earth see the greeks knew this stuff as well don't try that shit it's not good for your health unless you want to die you know but but don't because god says i will take you in my time you don't kill yourself and i was going to kill myself and that is a sin it's not nice to hear but it because what happens is if i take my life according to me it's me who's taken my life it's my ego and god don't want that he don't want he don't want us to destroy ourselves so you know you're in purgatory and then you're in between it's in the balances you know are you with uh, is because it's a cosmic battle between satan and the forces of this universe the for, the earthly things the material things are satan's domain and it's people have, have talked about it they're like well the scary thing about that is um we don't know you know um it's it's not a good idea to do that and anyone who and we can see this in daily life anyone who kills the self it destroys society it, it destroys families um suicide is what is one of the most heartbreaking things ever you know, if I'd have done that, it would have destroyed my mum. It would. And it would destroy, destroyed my son as well. That's why I say you don't kill yourself. You just don't do it. You, you just don't commit suicide. You must not do it. Because you... you because how I'm understanding it, you're alienating yourself from God. You've tried to make yourself into God. And that's what Satan wants to do. Satan's modus operandi is to try to be god he's trying desperately to be god but he can because god created him and like i said this this battle this epic spiritual battle is way beyond us um and what i'm going through is just simple earthly things they are but when you're in the heat of the moment when i'm in the heat of the moment it's really difficult and my boss is a hard man to work for he's not fucking tough <laughs> well here's the thing it's recognizing the faults in other people and always necessarily their faults they're my faults too because i recognize them maybe me and my boss are very similar in ways we are similar in that we're both human beings. This is the thing that I'm learning and this is what I understand why Jesus said this. He goes, hate the sin. Hate Lucifer with all of your heart. All of the hatred that you've got is towards Lucifer. But don't hate other people. And that, <laughs> it's so fucking hard to do. If someone else is pissing me off, and I can see that it's really objectively wrong because now I can understand there's good and evil. It's not the person. I mean, the person might be doing bad things to me and they need to be stopped, but it's not really them. It's the sin. It's evil. It's Lucifer that's working through them. They're not Lucifer. No one is ever truly a devil and no one is ever truly an angel. Just because I've got Jesus in my life does not make me a, an angel. It doesn't. I can, and just because I'm commanded to be Christ-like, I'm, I'm commanded to be like Jesus, does never mean, never means I'm going to be Jesus. Far from it. 
I'm just a mere human being. I'm Neil Gatenby. With all that shit that's happened and all this stuff that's happened in my life, I could never be like him. Even no matter how hard I try, I won't. And as I've said before, the 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 longer a human being, as I'm learning from Father Spirit on, the longer a human, well, he get he he, he always says this because it's not me. Because he gets so many thanks on his uh, uh, messages. He goes, look, people, he goes, this is not my wisdom. I'm just a priest. You know, this is the wisdom of the fathers of the church, of the um, saints, of the people who've gone out there into the real world and found out and then accumulated information. And, and he says, I'm sharing the wisdom that they've got. I'm just... Father Spirit on it. I've just been watching him now. I think he's just had a very sheltered life. <laughs> Fucking. He's such a nice, gracious man. And he, he says it when he got out of hospital. He did a video saying thank you. And he goes, I just want to say to um, everyone who's written the messages, he goes, I've done a hundred this morning, but I can't possibly get through all of them because people love him. There's Muslims who follow him because Muslims... They love Jesus Christ, they do. Um, Jesus is a prophet in Islam. And lots of people are working up, waking up to this shit because imams in mosques, they don't necessarily teach what Jesus said. They don't. They tell all Muslims, Yeshua is our prophet, we love him. But then when people go, what did Yeshua say? They go, uh, he said this and he said that, according to what they tell them. But if they pick up the Bible and go, Hey, Jesus said this to God. No, he didn't. Uh, be careful with imams. Some imams. But there's loads of Muslims who watch his videos and they go, Father, thank you so much. And loads, not just Muslims, but me, you know, atheists, all, all kinds of people. My mum watched him yesterday and she goes, Oh, what a lovely man. <laughs> he is just a lovely man. But the thing is, Father Spiridon, He's had quite a sheltered life. And most priests who are real good priests like that, they have, they've had sheltered lives and they've, they've probably not really seen much darkness. They've heard about it and they've read about it, but they've been protected by it in a lot of ways by the parents because maybe their his parents were priests. It's like they look... The, the idea of a priest is supposed to be someone who, who really can try his hardest to be Christ-like. So they've, they're sheltered, they've, they're given sheltered lives. I don't think Pharaoh Spiridon has ever swore. And so, can you imagine if someone like me came up to him with all my effing and jeffing, he'd be like, oh my goodness. You know, it's, there are some people like that. If you swear in front of them, the, the, it scares them because they see, blas well, they call it blasphemy, swearing. Because what swearing is, like my grandma used to say to me, <clears throat> and a lot of people say, they go, it's because you haven't got the words to express what you mean. And the fucking this and fucking that, it's, it's demonic is what it is. It's a demon that's coming out. But at least, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know, that's what, unfortunately, Father Spiridon and people like him, you need to understand, I'm only saying things and it's actions, right? But priests have often lit, they often live very sheltered lives. And so anything that's demonic, it scares them, it does. And, um... He did a video, it was so good, he, he came out of hospital, he had a heart operation and he um, he, he got, um, and he was just praising NHS, he just goes, oh, these people are so wonderful in England, because in Wales and Scotland it's slightly different, and he lives in Ireland now, but um, it, it, uh, Irish is, I don't know, it's slightly different, but the NHS England he's talking about. He goes, I was in within nine days and it was an open heart surgery. He goes, we got in so quick. And he goes, the people, he goes, all of these different people, he goes, they were all strangers. And he goes, they all, he says, I can remember one moment where there were all these different, all these people, nurses, doctors, surgeons, they were all running around for me to save my life. 
and he goes it was extremely humbling because I think he's been critical sometimes of the government and stuff and maybe NHS and stuff because you know it's an organization and an institution just like anything else and anything should be criticized but he goes when I got in there he goes it just made me realize this is amazing you know people all working so hard to save life and um, like I say Father Spiridon's a human being and um, all human beings are complicated and I think he's had maybe a bit of a, um, a sheltered life <laughs> I've had my life and it's different to his we're all working towards the same goal is to try and purify and what he says is his teaching from the fathers which he keeps reminding us he's like it's not my wisdom this because I'm it's wisdom that I was taught you know um, and I'm giving it to you because it's not my wisdom it comes from the fathers the um, the church fathers it's that unfortunately the longer a human being has been on this earth without God the more time Satan has had to hammer away at the person and it works on all different levels so that through the eyes through the ears you know it's a sensory bombardment and in the end what it does is it it, 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 it shapes the body but what it does is it's the heart and Jesus always talks about the heart and you're like what was he a heart surgeon yes he was not a physical heart surgeon but he talks about the heart not as just a physical organ that pumps the body the blood around the body like they're going how does my heart keep beating because it likes to it just does it just beats but it's the heart because jesus is saying we must see things we must see things the world in a spiritual way that's what he commands his followers the disciples when he does the sermon on the mount which is probably the one of the greatest thing even atheist scholars who don't believe in god they say that the sermon on the mount is one of the most incredible things that a human being's ever done it's very mysterious it's very hard to analyze it works on a very high level but it's also on a level that a child can understand because he, 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 he talks in metaphor and he talks in um parables he's not using scientific language because he could do if he wanted but why would he because it would alienate certain people he's talking so that an illiterate person a person who doesn't know how to read and write they can understand what he's saying because the logic is extremely complex but it's very simple to understand now oftentimes with it's the other way around with scientific theories and, th and, and stuff and mathematical problems the very simple the the answer that it gets to but it's very complicated how they get there jesus speaks in a very simple way but some of the metaphors that he uses are so simple that it's actually very hard it's hard for me because i'm 41 years old and it's like going right back to my childhood he talks about mustard seeds and he talks about yeah he talks about um this is one thing is he talks about the salt of the earth he says um you are the salt i want you to be the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it's true <laughs> once you get the salt out how is it going to come back in mm. i've been up since four because i was in bed at fucking six o'clock last night i was absolutely knackered emotionally knackered i had a headache my eyes were fucking pulsating i had the worst headache last night Maybe I didn't drink enough water, you know, doing hard physical labour in the sun, not drinking enough water, but it's all this stuff as well. It's all the shit that I'm going through. Um, at work. <laughs> Fucking boss is doing my head in, but is it my boss? No, it's Satan. And it's pretty easy to fight. He is. Yeah, so he goes, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if a salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by men. If you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. He says stuff like that. Talk lighting lamps. Don't keep it like that under a bowl. Let the light shine on the stand so people can see it. And if you're on a house, put your house on a hill so everyone can see your house and they can see the light. And then let your light be your good deeds in your life. Don't keep any secrets. What they see is what you are. There's no shadows. There's no, there's no dirt in Neil's life. It is, it has to be. I have to be the real deal behind closed doors because people are going to follow that light and when they get there and they see that there's all this sinister shit going on in the background they're going to turn away and so that's why I, I, if I'm following God he will I will be cast into hell if I do that because people are going to be drawn towards it and they're going to find out whoa God whoa this is evil he's saying God isn't it yeah like Jesus said in Matthew he goes when no in John when he talks about the um, exorcism he goes when I exorcise the man and the demon comes out and he's gone what's left is a house that's been tidied and it's and then the house is tidied up it's cleaned up like my life if the exorc if the demon is gone of alcohol my it, it says the the house the temple because that's how he refers to people's bodies our bodies as temples it says the temple has been aired out and purified and it's been cleaned and ordered and washed and um and and put in order but it's vacant it's interesting he says that he says after i've got rid of the demon initially the house will be cleaned tidied ordered arranged purified but it will be vacant and he said that demon will go away to his friends and he'll get seven more of them who are more stronger and more influential and more powerful than that demon and they'll come back into that house and they'll invade it and that man will be worse off than when he was before i understand exactly what jesus means by that if i he's going to have taken that demon of alcoholism away he has taken it away because I don't fantasise, I don't see alcohol in the same way, I totally see alcohol differently than I ever did, I see it as like putting a gun in my mouth and pulling the trigger, I don't, I, well not quite like that, because someone could, you know, like someone could hold me down and pour what, alcohol down me, but I'd be alright, because I'm pretty funny when I've had a drink, you know, I'd be alright, I'd be like, but I didn't put it down me, I am not going to do that, it'd be like putting a load of gun in my mouth, that's the same way I see it, because it's a deadly, toxic poison to me he's done that but the danger is the house has been tidied up and i've lost a bit of weight and all this lot now looking a little bit better feeling a lot better the house is is, is tidied but it's vacant if god does not if i don't allow god to come into my life and i well i don't he will if i want him to if i stop him and if i stop and, and sort of turn away no matter how tough i think i am if i think oh it's just me look how amazing how i am look how splendid i am for cracking alcohol and if i listen to worldly voices because other people will say that voices of the world they will say to me neil it's not god it's you you've done it and if i listen to them and take on god and i allow that to come in i will be a vacant vessel because all it is is just me it's just, I'm just the ship, there's no captain and there's no wind and everything, it's just me, I'm adrift and what, what he says is, he says um, the demon, it might not necessarily be the demon of alcoholism of alcohol, of whatever that was I don't see alcohol as the demon, I see it as um, it's like a spiritual thing, so it like 
it was the thing that could break the chink it was a chink in the armor and through my alcoholism when i was drunk that's when it was all falling apart but he says removing that the danger is it'll be a vacant empty vessel and and the demon will come back with seven others and the, the other seven will be t way more powerful way stronger way more cunning and and they will invade the house and the man will be worse off than he was before i will be worse off if i'm not careful and what i understand is this purifying of my heart which is very hard because my heart has been beating for 41 years and um it's been all of the the negative stuff all of the data has been absorbed and it's formed me who i am now and i have got a quick temper i am a proud person i am and father spirit on talks about this it's not necessarily the pride that a father has for his son or a friend has or i'm proud of my son because that's slightly different it's like you're genuinely happy for what someone's done and that's always good because that's of god pride is pride is that what i've said about it's me neil gatenby whatever that is it's me it's this hand it's this these sinews it's the it's the muscle that i've got it's me and i've done it on my own that is demonic because that is what did satan is satan is pride pride comes before the fall satan was proud against god that's why he was fallen that's why satan fell well it says he was cast down god cast him down it's not down it's through if it threw him out of the kingdom and, and, and into like a net it's like an invisible net that's gone into creation and satan's here now he's everywhere he's in the universe he's, he's, he's as far as we can see into the universe he's, he's like infused creation it's not that he is creation it's that his energy has infused it pride came first the pride that the, the moment that the the, the 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 feeling or the thought or the idea of pride came first and then he was cast down and the, and the same works on a massive intergalactic scale or a, a huge energy scale like that and it works in a, a human's heart because a human's heart is made of the same stuff that the universe is made of made of atoms and matter and pride comes before the fall and you will f i will fall if i'm proud so what i need to do now is r recognize that it's uh, purifying my heart and it's hard to do because all that pride needs to come out i am a proud person i am uh, no it's not that i am it's that I can be, I have the potential to be easily, in the flip of a dime I can be. I was so frustrated yesterday about this micromanagement thing. And it's not my boss telling me, it's all this tale telling that I don't like. It's Michael who comes to me, Mik Mikhail. Mikhail means bearer of light as well. No, no, the light, because Michael is the Archangel Gabriel. This guy's called Michael. He's like, Neil, um, you're going to do this on Saturday and all this lot. And uh, just remember, there's cameras. I know that. I've been there for fucking months. There's cameras around the building. So basically, it's my boss telling me, Neil, I'm watching everything that you're doing. He's micromanaging me. And you know what? It makes me angry. But that's pride. Because I'm, I'm me then. And I'm, how dare you speak to me? I've, I've, said, I've said that to him before. I've spoke to him in those ways. And he doesn't like it. How dare you speak to me like that? You don't like it. And you know what? I wouldn't like it if people spoke like that to me. But I treat people as I want to be treated. And if I'm treating someone like that, and they spoke to me like that, like I spoke to him, then I'd, I'd take it on the chin. It's that I don't like injustice. I don't. And I'm able now to fight for 
justice, whatever that means. Because again, this stuff is cosmic justice and it's not earthly justice. It's not, there is no real justice in this world. There isn't. I have the story of my life. And what kind of justice am I going to want against my boss? He's the boss. He will win in one dimension. And I was really, really, really pissed off yesterday. But I, I did it with my work. I were attacking that massive fucking brambles and they were sticking all over me. I fucking blood all over the place. I was like, fuck me. But I was, I was just attacking. I got fucking destroyed it all. Because it was just um, this thicket. And I was thinking, no, think of it like that. You know, this is Satan's kingdom. These are horrible things, you know, like all these, you know. It looks a mess, and it does. And we've got to clean it right back to the fence. And it wasn't as big a job as I thought, really. It looked like a forest, but then when I'd cut it down, it were, like, all um, quite small, and it'll all decay and work down. So I took it out, and that's the thing, taking the anger out on something constructive, and that's what we had to do. We've got to clean it up because it looks a mess down there. Then there's this little robin that, like, fucking, it was just, like, skittering around on them, like, whoa, it's well pissed off today, and it just fucked off. It's going to have to find a new home, but sorry, old buddy. Um, it ain't all about you. It'll find another place. And like my mate said, they don't live that long. Anyway, the one that I've seen might be, it might have been two, because I've been there since November. The other one might be dead, so, you know, it's only a fucking robin. Um, but it's one of God's creatures. But it'll, it, they're hard. It'll find somewhere else to live. And what am I going to do? Fucking cry about a... <laughs> am I going to let my fucking sanity be destroyed by a fucking bird? Birds. <laughs> Ain't got no birds. Birds have destroyed my fucking... No. Somebody's talking about that. Ain't got no birds. With their red breasts. No. So, Yeah. It's understanding that pride comes before the fall. And I'm thinking, it got to a to point. I saw him twice yesterday. And I normally say, morning, I couldn't speak to him. <laughs> I couldn't say it. I'm just as bad as he is. He is a childish man. He's in his 60s and he is childish. But I'm childish too. My boss can be quite childlike and I've seen it. And if Jack, if he's watching... I mean, I'm, you know, it's talking about people on Facebook. I only told the truth. It's funny. It's true. It's, my boss can be funny. He is. He's like a big kid. Yeah, and like childlike. But like St. Paul said, you've got to drop all the childish things. The way he's saying it of himself, isn't he? Because again, I, I shouldn't be preaching to other people. I shouldn't, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not telling my boss what to do with his life. It's his life. But for me, like St. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I played like a child. I lived like a child. Because you have no choice, do you? You're a child. But when I became a man, I dropped all the childish things. There's nothing wrong with being childlike. There is a problem if you're 41 or 60 odd years old and you're acting childish with it. And it was childish. I went to get something. I was thirsty, I had to come down to the main building to get some water and I saw him and I thought, should I say morning? And I said, no, and he didn't say it to me either. And then later, he was with Michael and he walked past me and he looked at me as if to say morning and I didn't say it. And then he, <laughs> he didn't say it either. But I'm the one that said it because when we had our confrontation last fucking on Monday, he goes, right, he goes, you don't have to deal with me anymore now, Neil. He goes, you deal with Michael. And I went, good. He goes, because <laughs> that's childish. He went, you don't have to speak to me anymore. And I went, good. And he went, and then I tried to tell him about a problem at weekend. And he went, you don't have to, he goes, you don't tell me. He goes, tell, my, <laughs> tell Michael. And that Michael was just started. He, he didn't know what to think. He would have stood there. He would just stood there. First time he's met me. And uh, he's going to be my line manager and he's met me and he was like, who the fuck's this? I was just going, you said this and you said that and now it's all changed. And he's going, but that was three weeks ago. And I goes, it wasn't three weeks ago. I goes, it was last week and the week before. And I goes, I work 20 hours. I goes, it was 20. 
And I mean, bless my feel me, were like, he's like, he's probably thinking in his mind, how dare you speak to me like that? But he were like, he knew that he were wrong and he were like, uh, yes, but that's, but I told you that and I go, Steve, it's all in the past. It don't matter now. I goes, I accept, it's all changed. That's how it works. I goes, that's how it works here. I goes, everything changes every second. I went, it's in the past. We won't go there anymore. We're in the moment. I goes, what do you want me to do now? And he, <laughs> he went, uh, he was fuming. He was well pissed <laughs> off. But he gets wound up with me because he doesn't have people standing up to him and he needs it. He ain't pushing me around. Jesus Christ did not save my life. And he did not, he did not, he does not make human beings, he does not want human beings to be pushovers and doormats. And I'm not letting, I'm not becoming a doormat and a pushover for nobody. And especially not for fucking minimum wage. And that's what I've told him. It's minimum wage, I'll just go. I'll be, I'll be the 19th person to leave. He goes, who told you, <laughs> who told you 19 people have been here? It's probably an exaggeration because I'm childish. But I go, Steve, everyone's leaving. And I said, I'll leave too, if you carry on like this. And I think that's what he wants. He wants me to go. But I ain't going nowhere, because I like the job. I like the job, it's just the boss is hard. And this is the thing. I love my boss. I just hate the sin. It's the same thing, and I have to see it like that. And that's what I was thinking about yesterday. I was just thinking of little games inside my head that if he's going to play this game, I'll play that game, and I'll do this, and I'll do that. And do you know what I was thinking? I have to do it right. I have to do my job to the best of my ability, and then there will be no problems. And then Michael's going, you do realise there's cameras all over the side and stuff. And I'm like, fuck me, I knew that from the start. I ain't got nothing to hide. And then he's like, can you do eight while um, I'm, I'm working different hours now? So he's changing my hours. And I'm like, okay, yeah. It says in my contract I can be flexible, so yeah. And at the end of the day, it's not a spiritual battle. This is not, a, you know, it's like, it is a spiritual battle, but it's only a job. And I'll just get another job. Plenty more jobs for minimum wage. And I'm not bothered. I'm, I'm humble now. I'll do anything. I've been a cleaner. I'll, I'll go back to cleaning. But yesterday was very hard. It was hard. No. It was actually quite he easy. Because I just got on with it. And working with JC, nothing is hard. There's an answer for it. I'm telling you, this is why he winds it up. This is why he got killed. This is why they killed him. And I know why today. Jesus, people who are following Jesus' teachings, they will be persecuted by clown world. Satan cannot stand it because he kind of does have an answer for everything. This guy, Jesus, from Nazareth, a Nazarene, a f some fucking shit all in chickenly. That's basically what they were saying about him. From Nazareth, you're following a guy from Nazareth. It's a fucking right dump, they're all scrubbers. You follow, you're following a guy from Nazareth. Let's look at his credentials. All right, let's look at his credentials. Carpenter. He's a joiner. He's not a scribe or a Pharisee. He's a nobody. That's what they were saying about him. But Jesus was God. They were going, he's not a scribe or a Pharisee. He hasn't been to university. Jesus didn't have a PhD. No, he didn't have a PhD, and he wasn't a scribe and a Pharisee. No one is a Pharisee. The Pharisee was just a name for the movement. It was God. And it goes further than that. He was the Logos. He was the logic. He was the word. Like John says, what does John say? John was one of his friends. One of his fr John's the one who didn't die. The only one who didn't get killed. All the rest of them boiled alive. Luke got boiled in a vat of uh, boiling oil. So deep fried alive. Paul beheaded in front of Nero. 
part Peter as well in Rome. He was reverse crucified. Some say it were flayed alive. I don't know. Um, all these men were killed. And and women as well. You know, everyone. They tried to kill everyone. They tried to destroy them. Didn't work. Yeah, John says here. The word came. Bef the word became flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It's like, get that around your fucking head. Maybe only someone from Chickenly can understand. Because those people in university with PhDs, they don't seem to get it. It works like that. C.S. Lewis, he had PhD. C.S. Lewis was a fucking genius, and he, it took him a long time. He was an, he was in his, he converted as an adult. He didn't get it until later in his life. Like he said, I was blind most of my life. I could see, but I was blind. I can see, but I'm blind too. Jesus talks about sin being in, you commit the sin first, and this is one of the things that they hated. The Ten Commandments, living your life according to that. That's all they thought that they had to do. They thought, okay, I go out into the world, and as long as I don't kill anyone, that's okay. And Jesus uses the example of adultery first. They said that adultery is bad because it is bad. If you cheat on your wife or you cheat on your husband, it creates toxicity and it and it breaks people's hearts and it breaks slowly breaks society up. It does. If you it should be you love intimately love one person and you don't love you don't shag around you just don't shag around because it's toxic and it creates a lot of it's like a cancer that spreads it's like po poisoning a well you know one tiny drop of poison goes into the well and it toxifies the whole thing that's what sleeping around does it, it does it toxic it's toxic and it's toxic for your body why do you think we've got venereal disease <laughs> it's a warning isn't it like saying you shouldn't be slack shagging around you get warts and fucking gonorrhea and all this crap you shouldn't do it it's a warning human beings are not made to be promiscuous they're not they're made to have one partner like the ducks the mallards they stay together why can't we be like them some animals can be promiscuous but it's interesting that those animals those groups of animals that are very promiscuous they usually have short lives like rabbits and things like that Rats, rats have a quite a short lifespan. Um, pigs and things like that. But there are certain animals that um, doves are like that as well. And animals that are, human beings are supposed to be like that. We're supposed to learn from the animal kingdom. We're supposed to learn and look and go. Okay, and we don't. We just become animals. The worst of the animals. We're supposed to be the paragon of animals. And with our filthy and disgusting behaviours and sin, we can actually become the worst animals. And it's true what people like Greta Thunberg and all these environmentalist nutjacks, what they say is true. A human being who's unrestrained and large groups of human beings who are unrestrained are toxic for the environment. We are. We waste so much. The garbage that we create physically and spiritually is untold. Um, yeah, it's true. Jesus says, they, at the time, people would have just said, oh, all I need to do is not cheat on my wife. And then it's A-OK, -okay, everything's OK. God is pleased. When Jesus, Jesus says, he goes, you first commit adultery, he says, it is written, and I tell you the truth, that you have been told that adultery is wrong. It is wrong. Cheating on your wife is wrong. Cheating on your husband is wrong. Actually, the act of cheating on your husband. So you go out and you get another boyfriend. Yeah, or you, you do it behind your husband's back. Or if I do it, if I do, if I cheat on my my husband's fucking or my wife, if I cheat on my wife. We actually, actually have sex with another woman other than my wife. The actual act of doing it. Jesus is more radical than that. 
He says, no, I say to you, what does he say in Matthew 5? He says, you commit adultery in your heart first. And people are like, what do you mean by that? He goes, you have had sex with a woman if you look at another woman lustfully. And they're like, that's why he's saying, you don't look at women in a lustful way. And they're like going, but I ain't committed adultery, I ain't had sex with it. He goes, you've, you've committed it in your heart. And I'm telling you, some people that's what they wanted to hear. In the book of Job, he says that, Job, he says, I purified my eyes first and then I didn't look at the virginal young woman in a sexual way. Because the reality is that a lot of men do. They look at other women and they're committing adultery all the time. They're not having sex. They're married, but they're not going out there shagging around, but they're doing it in their heart. They're looking at a woman going, oh, look at tits on that, look at ass on that, look how fit she is. And they're having sex with her in their mind. And God don't like it. But it makes me feel good. It makes me feel awesome. It's a sin. Because that woman that you're looking at is not just nice tits and a nice ass. She's a human being. But she would dress like that. Well, she's a flawed human being then, isn't she? Because she's showing the world that all that's all that matters is that her big tits and a nice ass. She's been, but she's on her own journey, and that's her problem, right? It's your problem because you have the responsibility in your life to control your life that woman can't control that woman's life is her life and she can do whatever she wants you have to control yourself and look away or look at the woman but don't just see her in a lustful way see her in a different way why does it always have to be sexual and a lot of people who were listening to him are like yeah i know what you mean by that Because in reality, a lot of the women who do dress like that, and men as well, they're actually, um, they're actually, there's more going on than just that. They usually, it's usually the flip side. A lot of times spiritually, it's the flip side. They're actually very insecure. But on the outside, they look so physically beautiful and attractive and everything. But when, when you get to know them, they're not. They think that they're very ugly on the inside. The Greeks worked that out with narcissism and things. I'm not saying that everyone who dresses promiscuously is a narcissist. It's not true. But they're saying that beauty in the eye of the beholder, these people are constantly looking at their physical image. It's like looking into the the, what, the mirror or the glass and the, they're obsessed with themselves and then the beasts can come and kill them because they're not looking, they're not paying attention. It's the same thing, isn't it? You know, if you're constantly looking at your own self-image, just the image of, oh, look at my, look at my pecs and look at this. You're looking at yourself in the mirror and the beast is going to come in the jungle. The, the leopard or the fucking bear is going to attack you and eat you because it's hungry. Because it sees weakness. It sees that you're not paying attention. You're paying attention to something superficially. And it's the same way in a spiritual dimension. If all, if all I'm doing is paying attention to the superficial things and thinking about sex and looking at a woman in a lustful way all the time, the demons are going to come in because the house is vacant. But he just uses that as an example because there were mainly men who were listening to him and all men maybe think the same way. But there were women in the crowd who were listening to him as well. Women understood this as well. Because it's not just lust that's, that's a problem. It's other things that are a problem. The resentments that I, I had against my boss. Was I harboring murderous intentions? Like it says, thou shall not murder. Oh, but I, well, the Jews interpreted it at the time as thou shall not murder. Because somebody can come into your house or your home or someone can invade my space and they can try to they can try to kill me so I'm gonna fight back and I could I could kill them 
in it under law it's called manslaughter isn't it if they started it and they're they're trying to kill me but i i hit them to the floor or smash them in the head and they die i've killed that person but i haven't committed murder right so at the time it was hard and and no one's ever been able to really explain did jesus mean that is he talking about because it comes from the hebrew word and Jesus used to speak to the crowds in um, Aramaic or Greek sometimes, but he understood Hebrew. And like, what does he mean? Is it, is, does he mean it's wrong to kill? Because you have to kill creatures, you do. We're killing creatures all the time, you know what I mean? There's fucking bacteria that's dying all the time. You know, if there's a wasp crawling on you, sorry, buddy, you're dying. You have to kill. If you want to eat meat, you have to kill the creature. And if someone's going to come into my house and try to kill me, or I'm going to fight back. If someone touches my kid, I will fight. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and in fighting, I might kill. Does Jesus mean that? I don't know. And you'd have to look it up. But it, it specifically says, in the English translation, it says, thou shall not kill, but but many Jewish scholars and um, scholars say that it doesn't mean that. It means thou shall not murder. Because murder is something that's committed in the heart first. It's not... It, it, murder is premeditated. To kill, it, I mean, it's reactionary. If someone's fighting, it's like an animalistic thing. The fight or flight thing comes in. I'm not someone who runs away. I will, I will fight. I will. I'm a fighter. So it, when the fight happens, it, you can kill. I could be killed or they could be killed. Killing is just a natural part of the natural world. It is. Um, and is it wrong? Is God saying that it's wrong to kill? Because some people have said, well, if it is, we're going to all be devoured by the world because you, it means that fight or flight, we have to run. And if we run, our enemies get stronger. And, you know, it's been interpreted in different ways. Thou shall not. Murder is been what it's said because murder means I'm going to go out and I'm going to find that bastard and I'm going to go to his house. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask around and you've planned it. It's premeditated and that is wrong because it's not in the heat of the moment. God does not like that. He says you don't murder. Diplomacy first. Wisdom and um, kindness and gentleness and dropping, turning the other cheek. You do that first. And then if it comes into an altercation, that's not murder. It's a fight. It's a fight. Murder is premeditated. So, you know, I'm like thinking yesterday, I was so pissed off. I was really pissed off. I was just like, he's fucking playing these childish games. And he's micromanaging me. But I didn't used to be like I were a pushover. I, when I were drinking, I, I were meek and mild, and I'd just get on with it because I knew that I could go home and have my tinnies. But I don't drink anymore now. So I'm like, I'm standing up for myself. And I understand exactly what Jesus means. Once the demon has gone, seven others can potentially come back and invade the temple. And all of a sudden, you're in a worse place than you were before because what happens if I become this arrogant, pride ma proud man? I'm going to be fighting uh, all the time. Not fighting physically, but fighting uh, fighting against what? It's pointless to fight, pick fights with Satan. It is. It's p pointless, because you are going to lose in the end. Remember, Satan always wins in this world. Always, because we all die. That, that, that's what... He ought, the only weapon he's really got is death and deterioration. And then if you see it, if, if I see it like that, that the only thing that he's got against me is that I'm going to die one day and that my body's going to slowly deteriorate and all the things that I ever going to deteriorate, that if that's all I've got and I can overcome that and see it, the veil lifted and see it for what it really is, I have nothing to be afraid of anymore. But why am I going to pick a fight all the time? <laughs> and I'll tell you. I fucking came home from work yesterday and I had a pounding headache. I wanted to go to the skate park, but I was tired, I was, I was aching and I had this pounding headache and um, I had my tea and it got to 
12 hours ago, 6 o'clock, 12 hours ago, and I, went, I've, I've nodded off on the sofa, and I woke up, my head, it was even worse, so I drank loads of water, and I just went, right, shut curtains, well, I just went to bed, and then I woke up um, a couple of times, and then got up about half three, and I must have needed it. So it's an accumulation of things. I'm not going to put it all on my boss. It's not me. It's not my boss's fault. It's my fault because it's my life, and I can do. I can. I can do something with my life, can't I? But the proud person in me, the the potential of being a proud person, I would put it on him, and I would make him my enemy, and I'll lose. So I need to pay attention to that. I'll just put this video on now for anyone who's interested. Father Spirit on. If you're not a Christian or whatever you are, it doesn't matter. He's just a very, my, my mum goes, what a lovely man. He is a lovely man. And I feel very protective over him. <laughs> because I think he, he gets genuinely shocked by the things that are going on. And remember, most priests have had quite sheltered lives. And he's getting genuinely shocked about the things that are happening now. I mean, maybe that happens as we get older anyway, but he's a very gentle, kind man. And as I say, uh, some of the language I use and things, it's maybe offend some people. You know, I need to watch that with curse words and things like that. But it's the demon that's coming out. I'm purifying my heart. I am. I'm trying. And it's hard. Because I'm 41 years old and I've had 41 years of corruption. I've allowed my heart to be corrupted for 41 years. So, yeah, this is really interesting. He talks about purifying the heart. I've, I've, I've spoke about it before. And it's essential for me. For those who seek the eternal joy of God's kingdom, God gives a small glimpse in the festivals, the feasts, as we journey through the year. There in the celebration of Pascha, as we rejoice in the resurrection, and in the nativity that is just about to come, and in all of the other feasts, we are granted by God through his grace a small taste of that great joy of the eternal kingdom, of the eternal feast of God's kingdom. And it is given to us by God to encourage us. A small taste of what is to come. The road to these festivals, to the major feasts, of course, is the fasts. And it's the same road that leads to the eternal festival of God's kingdom. The road of struggle. It is the road of purification. The fasts that we endure, that we struggle through in order to reach the great feasts of the church year are a small image of our whole life as we struggle towards this eternal feast of God's kingdom. And it is one of purification. We can't claim to be Christian Unless we accept this need to be purified, it's the... Ah, oh, fuck me. But it is the authentic... Hold on, let me just have a look where it's at now. Because it always does this. Whenever I rewind a fucking video, I'm, I always say I'm going to fucking delete this fucking YouTube. <laughs> I'm not. Every time I need to reload the video because the buffering... BT, I'm, see, I'm going to get angry now, but once it comes out, it won't come out again. BT, I'm paying them fucking £27 a month for this fucking, they say, upload speed of this and upload speed of that. It's a lot of bullshit with all this wind and stuff. I get no, nothing. Do I get a refund? Do I? Fuck. <laughs> Father Spiridon's fuming. He's like, no, Father Spiridon's terrified. He's like, oh my goodness. You know, I'd... <laughs> It'd be like, I'd be like, Father, sorry. And I'd be like, Father, just leave the room, please. Right, leave the room. And I'd be going, fucking BT, with that fucking signal. And he'd be like, oh my goodness, him and his wife, because he's married. <laughs> him and his wife. His wife's never come on camera, but I think him and his wife are right. He goes, 
My wife and I like to go driving so I can do these videos out in nature. Right, but I haven't been able to drive because of my heart problem and things. It's interesting, isn't it? A lot of um, these priestly type people, they have heart conditions. Do you know why I think that is? Because the world is so toxic and Satan is becoming so powerful that it does, it hurts their heart. It hurts, they have heart problems. And that's what he had open heart surgery a few um, a few months ago, a couple of months ago. And he's recovered fully now, he has. It's a miracle, it is. Do you know why? Because God loves him. God, God's looking out for him. And he says it were terrifying. Um, it, he knew that it were a spiritual battle. The recovery was very hard. He said it was a big spiritual battle that were going on in his life. The recovery were hard, coming off the anaesthetic and things. He said it was very hard and he couldn't leave the house for weeks. And he, and he says, I was expecting to be out in nature and in the forests. And he goes, I just have to be patient. And he goes, God has taught me the gift of patience. God teaches us so many things and it's amazing if we stay on track. Right, let's see if this video has uploaded to the place where I left it. Oh, to eternal joy. Yes. A heart that isn't purified by the light of Christ can never perceive the light of God's kingdom. We'll never know that joy of God's kingdom. The Church Fathers teach us that the foundation of our purification is humility. To be purified, we must be humbled. As the Psalmist teaches us, every prideful man is unclean before God. And as St. James teaches us in the New Testament, God gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Pride is our enemy. Pride is a spiritual disease. Only through humility is the heart able to be purified by God's grace. And and remember, you know, I I often get the names wrong. I think um, James was uh, was Jesus's brother, his biological brother, and James was very proud of his brother. Look at my brother. Look at Yeshua. Look at him. He's amazing. Pride. Does he mean it like that? Is it wrong to be proud of your brother? Not necessarily. He's talking about pride per se. And Jesus used to say that. Because James... I'm, I'm sure it was James who was his biological brother. And, and he was very proud of his brother. He was like, look at my brother. My brother's God. I think it's, it, James um, was killed after, after Jesus. They were all killed, all of them, for saying this stuff. But it's the most important stuff. This stuff changed my life. Christ, of course, is our first example of humility. He, through whom all things were created, the world, all that lives, ourselves, he became poor, he, he suffered insults, he suffered violence out of love for us in his humility. But we sinful creatures... We are so quick to boast in our pride. pride. Pride is a difficult passion to heal. Elder Ephraim of Mount Athos and Arizona says to us that the mind is easily polluted, but it's also easily cleansed. But the heart, it is difficult to cleanse. The mind is easily polluted and easily cleansed, but the heart is difficult to heal. It is with great difficulty that the heart is cleansed. It's into the heart that the passions sink their roots and why it brings so much pain when God uproots them. It brings us pain to be healed of these passions. The struggle, the falls that humble us, the defeats, the the humiliations, the losses of in our lives. These are powerful medicines that God allows in order to purify us. And they are painful. And the spiritual health that God leads us to through this painful, difficult process 
is eternal. Not, not just a matter of this world, like the struggles, like the temptations that we face, like the falls that we encounter, which are temporary. The healing that God brings is for something eternal. If we choose not to humble ourselves, if we choose to be proud, if we allow arrogance to rule over us, God in his love will permit us to be humbled beyond our choice. And we have a choice. We can seek to humble ourselves willingly, to repent, to enter into the fasts and to the life of spiritual struggle and humble ourselves. Or in his love and mercy, God will humble us. And he will humble us beyond our choice. This spiritual process requires us to examine ourselves. Self-examination is so important. Let us watch our hearts. Let us watch our reactions. When, when someone criticizes us, do we become distressed? Do we become angry? Do we cling to resentment towards this person, reminding ourselves of what they've said about us or to us? Or like the saints, do we rejoice inwardly with gratitude? Gratitude for the, for the saving medicine that God has permitted us to taste. The proud heart will, will be angry, will be resentful. The humble heart will accept criticism and it is the humble heart that will be at peace. And as I say, this is a, a painful process, particularly at first. The, the uprooting of pride requires self-reproach. It requires an acknowledgement of our sinfulness because Pride lurks beneath so much of what we do and, and we, must, we must defeat it. We must accuse ourselves more forcefully than anybody else. Whatever criticisms we hear and receive from others, let us criticize ourselves. Let us reproach ourselves more forcefully than anybody. And let us, let us always be the first to both offer and seek forgiveness. Let us always be the first. Let us not cling to desire to be right and prove ourselves right, but let us seek forgiveness and let us offer forgiveness. El Rifran says to us, it's the meek who will enter the kingdom of God and the proud who will remain outside. So why, even as Christians, do we allow pride not only to, to grow but to remain within our hearts. Well, partly because it comforts us, it, it, it reassures us, it, it acts like a shield to the truth. It, it defends us against the truth of who we are and our own sinfulness and the darkness that is truly within us. It, it acts like a shield when criticism comes and helps us feel temporarily a little better. And it protects us from knowing ourselves, prevents us from seeing ourselves. But at judgment, on the day of judgment, we will see how deeply we have been wounded by pride, every one of us. And of course then, it will be too late to repent. So let us open our eyes now in this life where while God gives us in his mercy, an opportunity to repent of this pride. Because we know judgment is coming, in our minds at least. But our hearts, our hearts can remain blinded by pride and egotism even when we know something mentally. Yeah. Even when we may say something with our lips. Our hearts will cling to our sin, to our pride. And and worldly voices will try to convince us, to argue, to, to shout back, to reject the criticism, the accusations. The worldly voices will say, stand up and speak out, protect yourself, defend yourself, shout back and react. 
demand that we are not at fault. But these voices will wound us. They will wound us spiritually. They will keep us from entering paradise. We must not listen to them. We must not listen to these voices of the world that demand such pride from us. We should let the words of the Jesus prayer be, be a continuous reminder to us of the truth. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let these words continuously be on our lips. Let them help us to recognize the truth. And while we still have time here on earth, let us seek, let us, let us accept God's healing of this spiritual disease. Yeah, it is a spiritual disease. It is a spiritual disease. The, the only hope of salvation from delusions and heresies, the innovations and the traps of the wicked people and of the devil is prayer, repentance and humility. So, you know, he, he did that at a time of Lent. That's when most Christians try to... Um, mimic what Jesus did when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and most Christians and people around the world try to copy off what he did on one superficial level by fasting from food so people are saying right I'm not going to eat anything for as long as I can I'm not going to eat food to you know to detoxify I'm not going to smoke cigarettes I'm not going to drive my car for 40 days I'm not going to they're doing it in a superficial level Jesus is way more radical than that. He says, you people, why are you fasting from food? Is it because you're so vain and that you want to lose weight? He says, no, fast from the things in your heart. Fast from pride and arrogance. Fasting from that desire to get one up on someone else all the time and prove to someone, I'm fucking this and I'm that. Fast from those things. Fasting at a spiritual level as, a, as opposed to fasting on a superficial, earthly level. When some people say, oh, I'm fasting, I'm not eating for three days. Why are you doing that? Yeah, you can have visions and things and you do lose weight and things, but are you only doing it because of that? Are you only doing it to lose weight so that you look a bit more better and you can shag around and you can be attractive to more people? Why are you doing it? Ask yourself that. Only you know that. Only I know that. Jesus is saying that the fasting from sin is the most important thing to fast from. Some people, they might be overweight and they can't lose weight. No matter, you know, it's different. Some people are easily disfigured. There's no amount of fasting that's going to make them more attractive. Some people are just physically not attractive. You fast from the things that are in your heart. That resentment that I've got against my boss. I have to fast from that shit. That, 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 trying to prove him wrong I have to fast so if I see him today I'm going to say morning to him I'm not going to be a miserable bastard I'm not going to play his games <laughs> Yeah, fast from sin I'm going to fast from arrogance and the more I can do that the more I can keep those because I'm told by my lord seven other demons are going to come in and invade the house just because I think I've cracked it with alcohol. Just you wait, Neil. There's going to be way worse demons. They're going to be way stronger because that other demon is going to bring seven of his pals and his buddies with him and they're going to be fucking hardcore and they're going to change me in a way that I could... I'm going to be um, in a lot of trouble. That's what Jesus said. He goes, the person who's, who, I, who I exercise, I'll exercise that demon. But if that person doesn't get his house in order, it, it's going to be vacant and the house will be invaded because the demon will come back with seven others who are more powerful and more cunning and more strong and they will destroy that temple. So, yeah, I need to be careful. I need to be humble. I need to be more humble, more degrees of humility. And it's hard to do, but it's not impossible. 
It's a damn sight better than drinking <laughs> over and out. Uh, today's gonna be a good day. Today I'm gonna learn from my lessons. Today I'm going to have a good day. And like my friend Emma said, she says, no, it's more than that. You say, I have had a good day. Well, I'll, I'll let's see how I go on. Let's see if I can say that tonight when I put my head on the pillow. Has it been a good day? That's the way I see it. No, I am going to have a good day. And let's see if I can say at the end of the day, I have had a good day. See how it goes.